What's up, everybody? This is Garrick with ACG, and as always, it's my continuing mission to bring you reviews that aren't two minutes long, or, as always, filled with sponsored bullcrap. Let's be honest, all of us superhero fans have wondered if the panacea of superhero beat-em-up games was ever actually going to come along, regardless of what platform you play it on. And I mean, we've seen titles come and go, and some have done very well, but none have really grabbed the title, raised it above their HGH sweaty foreheads, and said, you know what, I rule this genre. But then we have games like Deadbeat Heroes, who don't even try to do anything of the sort, who revel in their Avenger nobodies and Captain Bowflexes like a lower than Netflix version of a rent a hero who can't get their own TV show. You know something's up when the main base in a game has hospital beds in it so the Deadbeats can heal up after stepping into situations far above their fighting level. So let's see how a cell shaded 70s style superhero game can do when the main power the heroes have is actually not having any power at all and instead steal them from their enemies temporarily. Deadbeat Heroes is out Tuesday on Steam, and it'll go for $14.99. As always, if you like the video, maybe subscribe. So here's my review for Deadbeat Heroes, the fun of playing a complete nobody, 3, 2, 1, countdown to nothing, and the sweet release of Total Surrender. Graphics art first. So I dig cell shading, I always have, especially when it's done well and with that proper feedback in its game mechanics. You can have this sublime feeling like the game 13 offered, with special skills being represented on screen in comic book cutouts. And phenomenal use of framing across a uniquely varied series of locations, or even the Neo-inspired characters in, say, Jet Grind Radio that both offer a familiar jumping off point for the imagination, but also do an incredible job to differentiate a title from others in the genre. But in Deadbeat Heroes, we sort of have just a mess. First and foremost, there are some design elements I like, and while it took me a bit to get accustomed to the odd funhouse on steroids, nothing is built on a straight line look of the game. It and the bulky, awkward heroes and the villains they face look pretty okay, or the way the game pops up a big comic book bubble when you get a new power, framing you in this cool power moment right in the middle of the action, despite the fact that it forgets it's already done this three times prior, but I'll get to that in a minute. The real issue with the game here is, well, once you start moving. First, the animation is terribly janky, from the odd stuttering standing animations to the awkward pumpiness of someone's heroic run, which sort of change it from a let's get there in a hurry emotional rush to looking like someone's legs are not attached to their hips in the right way, and the character risks them just pumping off without his torso at any moment. And graphically, the cell shading, the flatter textures, and the line work do an incredible disservice to what is at times some pretty damn cool looking things that can go on, like your ability to run along the wall Matrix style and then recreate the extinction of the dinosaurs with some epic diving attack when you seem to just light on fire due to the speed at which you're trying to smash nog in an enemy. Or the way the enemy's bodies smash into the walls and blows plaster off of them. Or even how your special dash punch can render foes armless and legless, leaving human ham bits all over the level like you just walked into a friggin' cannibal delicatessen. The problem is, a lot of this is almost impossible to see when it's actually going on, especially after you get some of these special powers and you start shooting around and you get further into the game. Also, I have to say, man, I've been waiting for a game that simulates claustrophobia so well it sin suffers into seizures when they begin to play the game. Calling these locations small is an understatement, and after the game Harvey Weinstein's a couple levels whipping them out at you, you start to think, is this all there actually is? No, there's 35 of them, and most are as small and as unimpressive as the first one, and they take less than 5 to 10 minutes to get through. Here's the thing, games like this need a distinct and directed level of focus towards offering insight into where a character is and is not when they are doing their actions on the game screen. The design of Deadbeat doesn't actually reflect that at all, many times obfuscating anything that you want to see within the game level. Also, due to the level size and the overall blockiness of all the graphics in the game, you're either fighting the game world for a view of your character, especially when you and five enemies all meet in the middle of a room that looks like a circus funhouse and you start smashing the crap out of each other, or you're in a loading screen. That's pretty much it. Now, when one player is playing, it's somewhat okay, and the level of anarchy, while still incredibly high, is a bit more manageable. But add in another player, mix in a dash of the low-level and low-detail aesthetics, and unfortunately, it's this dynamic duo gameplay that ends up falling under the sword of too much of a good thing. Now, with low-level explosions, blocky lines, and heroes that can change color due to what superpowers they steal all combined, it becomes infuriating to try to keep track of your enemies, let alone yourself. And when you're fighting with a red superhero and you're in a blue suit, that's cool, until you steal someone's superpower and it turns the game version of you invisible, resulting in pow-bang-bop moments where the only way you actually sort of know what's actually occurring in the game is when you watch your points go up from killing somebody. Lastly, the locations are just not that good at all. Take, for example, some of the boss locations, which many times are in the same room, like there's some strange teleporting device and the main boss's only entry into the game world is by teleporting to this one single place, and if they escape it, they'll turn into friggin' pumpkins or something. 
Also, the game has some serious problems with its optimization. In fact, I don't really think you'd call it optimization. It's more like maybeization or possibilication. I don't know. But with an i7 at 4.2 and an NVIDIA 1080, at 1080p resolution, it was getting 60 FPS, but on the low or simple settings. If you set it up higher, you're talking 30s if you're lucky. So it's best to set the resolution high and the actual graphical effects down to fast or simple. The problem with this is there's no individual settings. So the only change you feel is short changed as you look around and think, okay, I guess this is good enough. On the lower power systems, you're gonna be setting it even lower. As a package, this is a victim of its own design and myriad technical problems. It's a game that in many ways goes for more form than function in hell, just looks at function and kicks it off the side of the truck and says, screw it, we need some more smoke, despite the fact that you couldn't see the character in the first place. Sound, music, and voice. I heard bones break. King work, we defeated a villain. I suspect there are no more, and it's all over. But if, on the off chance there are, get ready. I'm working on new devices and vehicles to help you. And I'm expanding the team, just in case. And let's do sound first. And yeah, it's pretty okay. You know, it's trying to channel low-rent 1970s superheroes and that cheesy superhero vibe, and it does it well with the shatter of glass and the thick boom of armored cars being smashed into, and it's all done fairly well. And when you're rebounding off an enemy, you just turned into separate meat mannequin parts and then leap into the air so that you can run across the wall, get behind a shotgun carrying enemy and freeze him. It all works really well. Is it informative to the gamer? No, not much. But the smaller areas, overall locations make this incredibly hard anyway. And the level of absolute destruction on screen means that fidelity is really not going to be at its high point here. And the channel separation also isn't incredibly wide. But to me, the buzzer stingers and old sound pizzazz you would expect from 1970s style comic book stuff actually hits really well here. And of course, that brings us to music. You know, this is OK. I guess it is true that it's going for that bounce, bounce, bow kind of vibe with monophonic synths leading the way. And it is from a way back time when every artist realized they could plug their instrument into something electric and suddenly create something that sounded like lava lamps having sex. It's not subtle in its callbacks. In fact, they're straight up in your face. And you know what? That's fine. The game isn't really attempting to fit anything in here that would be called subtle. Voice. There are many kinds of ways, like that 50 bucks you spent on those O.J. Simpson anger management classes or the existence of people who talk during a movie. But getting Jim Howick in your game and then writing what can only be described as junior level choose your own adventure books is borderline criminal. And then adding in others and doing the same thing all over again is even worse. Probably by the fifth or sixth introduction, an odd joke between one of the deadbeat heroes and Captain Super Fantastic Funny Sentence Man, and you're about ready to start looking for doll kitchen knives. It's aiming for the cheesy comic books from the Golden Age, and I get that, and at times it does hit it, but instead of Batman, we get 3D Man. Look him up. It's like having a superpower to turn into a friggin' fern. It's useless, but somehow probably better than what we have here. That's not to say that the overall performances are poor, because they're not. They do a suitable job delivering their lines, but sort of like a doctor saying, congratulations, you have soul cancer. In the end, it's the words that count, and here they count for almost nothing. I mean, let's be honest, you know it's bad when villains standing around a table have to basically tell you what the joke is. Gameplay. So the game starts out with you in your superhero clubhouse with a few basic places to learn the ropes from your instructor and the only real superhero in the game. You, on the other hand, are a deadbeat hero, someone without powers of your own who basically says, screw it, I'm still signing up, straps a mechanical gauntlet to your hand, and then rushes out into the game world to steal supervillains' powers from them to use against them. And that's pretty much the story. The problem is, everything in this game is disjointed. Everything. First, when you finish a level, the game just ends. You get a score, and then boom, you're done back at the start screen, and then you hit start only to load back into the game at the main base and continue on with the story. It not only interrupts the fluidity of the presentation, but it's just downright terrible as an idea, resulting in that worry that we've all had when these kind of things happen, where you get a little bit tenuous when it comes to hitting the start button, because you're like, is this going to overwrite my save game? Did it save? Luckily, no, it won't do that. It's planned, but it's very, very odd. Now, as you traverse these random locations, you start with a very basic punch attack, and you're introduced to both low-level buffoons like Baseball Batman and Dude Sent Out to Die number 32, but also the occasional powered mid-level villain, like someone with freeze, fire, explosive powers. Now, by defeating some enemies, you can steal their powers temporarily for use, turning yourself invisible to attack enemies that otherwise have some fairly strong defenses, or freeze them or otherwise. Now, the mechanic is actually solid and very interesting at first glance, and most of the normal enemies have some kind of general attacker defense. Like, for example, baseball bat-wielding thugs 
that really need to be dashed past so that you can confuse them, otherwise they'll block all of your attacks. But like most of the other elements in the game, combat itself and especially upgrading is disjointed. You finish the mission, you're ejected back to the start screen, then you start the game back up and you can then update your gauntlet for unique attacks. Now this is fine, but due to the way it loads like this, it's actually easy to forget that step. But that's really not the biggest issue. The issue is, is that none of it makes sense. You can't upgrade it with the powers you've stolen. Instead, it's just normal basic powers like dash punches, upgrades, and more powerful air attacks, and there's not many of them. Later, you can assign one special power to your character, but that's in a separate area, resulting in this feeling that you're enchanting your Michael Jackson glove of uppercutting and your boxers of invisibility separately. Or the fact that the game scatters red phones around the main base for you to activate to pick the levels you want to fight in, but they're in totally different areas. Now, once you're in a battle at the start, only your X button on the controller does anything. So you continue to progress and upgrade your gauntlet with four or five other moves. And again, your Y button takes on those special powers. But woe unto you if you die during a boss fight, because in what can only be described as the stupidest idea I think I've seen in a long time, if you lose a boss battle, you sent back to the level prior and you cannot fight the boss right away. You have to return through a prior location to unlock the boss again. This makes the boss battles, which aren't incredibly organic in the first place, a source of frustration, as much of the time those bosses are invulnerable until you figure out exactly what you need to do, resulting in this uneasy peace between jumping into the battles, knowing you risk that loss and more wasted time on a previous level if you lose, or just wanting to basically turn the game off. And of course, let's talk a little bit about control and difficulty. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to what I like to term as the hesitation engine. I mean, control isn't terrible, but it is a little bit dodgy already. But once you get some enemies onto the screen, even if you're way above 60 FPS, hit and jump many times results in a strange but slightly noticeable delay, thrown off both your timing as well as the look of the game. Now, if that sounds like fun, do you have a nice sharp edge table I'd like you to run your crotch into for about a week? If that's not enough to warn you something is up, there's also three test systems that I tested this on and the game just randomly started to refuse to acknowledge controllers were available for play. They were working in all the other games and hell even brought up the Windows recording game bar. But at some point, some benevolent god, probably tired of watching Mankind's Folly, namely my own and the poor scarred soul I asked to play this game with me said, you know what, enough is friggin' enough. Because even when you get into these levels and you start going through them, it's only four or five different rooms until that level is over. There just isn't that much here. And what is here is mired with an incredible amount of bugs. Fun factor. If games had superpowers, this one would probably be apathy because disappointments contained for things that seemed like they had a chance to succeed. But this game in its current form is the absolute pinnacle of not being ready for prime time. And the fact that it's as buggy as an Amsterdam bedspread doesn't really help that. I mean, it actively just didn't seem to want me to play it. Now, sure, there are some elements that could be cool if each one of them weren't impacted by a design choice that seems like it wouldn't allow for the game to elevate from tedium to at least somewhat of a ticklish excitement. Take away the bugs and you're still stuck with a game that, for me at least, just doesn't really hit where it should at all. To me, games like this should be a progression where you go out, you fight the bad guys, you return home to your area and you upgrade and then you go back out again. And in many ways, the game looks like that's what it is, but everything falls apart the moment you move around or the moment you try to go to a level or hey, the moment you go back. And sure, you can gain four no-named fighters to fight along with you in this, but if someone said, hey man, let's watch some cool movie while I saw parts of your body off, you'd probably say, no, I'll pass. So as you guys know, I rate games on a buy, wait for sale, rent, or never touch again rating scale, with rent being replaced by deep, deep sale on PC. This is absolutely a never touch. The game is a travesty. It doesn't work very well, it doesn't play very well, it doesn't look very good, and it doesn't perform very well. In the end, you have a title that, at even at an incredibly low amount of money, you don't even know if it will work or see your controllers or play. It is buggy, it absolutely is not ready for prime time. So I hope you guys liked the video. If you did, give it a thumbs up. Maybe check out Twitter or Patreon. That's how I continue to give you guys reviews that aren't two minutes long or filled with sponsored bullcrap. If you dislike the video, give it a thumbs down and stay tuned. We've got a ton of different patron events that are coming up. We've got our B movie night. We've got our gaming with Carrick sections and of course, more reviews, including Elix and for sure, Evil Within 2. Peace out and enjoy the rest of your week.